Welcome to uh, Become a Millionaire, session five. So um, as you all know, this is session five of 12, and uh, we're almost to the halfway point. So Don't Quit by John Greenleaf Whittier. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when funds are low and debts are high, when you want to smile, but you have to sigh. When care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Life is queer with its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learns, and many a failure turns about, when they might have won had they stuck it out. Don't give up though the pace seems slow, you may succeed with another blow. Often the goal is nearer than it seems to a faint and faltering man. Often the struggle has given up when he might have captured the victor's cup. And he learned too late when the night came down how close he was to the golden crown. Success is failure turned inside out, the silver tint of the clouds of doubt. And you never know how close you are. It may be near when it seems so far. So stick to the fight when your heart is hit. It's when things seem worst that you mustn't quit. So I, I chose this selection for today's session because we're at session five of 12. So you're almost halfway through your journey. And I think it signifies how, you know, when this course first started, when you did first sessions one and two, everything was new, everything was exciting. And you were feeling very uh, enthusiastic about the program. And as things move along, you find out that it is a lot of work. There's a lot of material to learn and you can get a little discouraged. So this poem really um, really hits home the, the, uh, the fact that you know, it's a long journey and you really shouldn't give up because even if uh, things are looking challenging or difficult or slow, you know, that's the time you really need to stick with it. So uh, with that, uh, we'll go into the agenda for tonight. So I'm going to begin with a uh, review of last month's session, which was session four. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about expand wealth 5%, which we actually discussed in session two. But that was more of an introduction. Today, I'm going to go into a lot more depth and explain why uh, this particular methodology I put together will get you 5% uh, per year return in the long run. And then I'm gonna move on to the next phase, which is a phase two, which is expand wealth 10%. So now I'm gonna take your investing from uh, the knowledge of getting 5% annually to 10%. And I'm gonna talk about that in a lot greater detail, just to give you a lot more um, color and a lot more breadth on the topic. And then we move to a topic that I'm very excited about. This is a putting together your become a millionaire plan and it's one of two sessions. And this is the first time since session one that I bring everything back together. I've talked about the become millionaire strategies. I've talked about buying a house and now we put it all together and we will show you how you can become a millionaire in a, in a, um, in a reasonable amount of time. And then we'll review session five and then we'll talk about uh, what we've talked about and what we'll do for the rest of the year. So let's talk about session four. Uh, session four was about buying a home and it's one of three sessions. And what I focused on in session one was really some of the reasons for purchasing a home. And I tried to simplify it by calling it A, B, C, D, and E. It was appreciation, building a monthly savings, cutting taxes, deducting principal, and ending rent increases. So that was A, B, C, D, and E. And I believe those are the most compelling reasons, financial reasons for acquiring a home. And that becomes a, a, a key part of becoming a millionaire. Then we went to CEO of your career uh, in some uh, depth. This is session one of two. And we talked about your two roles as CEO of your career. One is that you, know, you are the product. So I mean, you're actually the person who's being promoted and marketed in role two in terms of trying to increase and augment your income. 
And then we covered the first three of 10 steps to become CEO of your career. Um, and then we spent some time developing your long-term career plan. And then I did a quick update on expand wealth. And then uh, we had six homework items, two for buy a home. One was to do some reading about uh, buying a home. Uh, the other was to look at the buy a home spreadsheet and play around with uh, you know the interest rate, the, the purchase price of the home, down payment, et cetera, and look at what that looks like. And then we had three, uh, we had three items for C of your career. You'd come up with a, a personal vision, you have to know yourself better, and you have to build your long-term career plan. And then we did the, the API C of your job, which is to um, analyze your job performance, uh, put together a plan, and then implement that plan. So that was um, last month. And today we're going to dig deeper into Expand Wealth 5%. So before I do that, I wanted to give you an overview of what I'm going to be teaching in the five uh, expand wealth sessions. So uh, phase one investing, which was session two, I also called it investing baby steps, was really an introduction to investing. It was to get you started. And, and that was um, to get you to expand wealth 5%. Today, we're going to phase two of investing. And what I'm doing today is I'm adding the, the become a millionaire watch list, and I'm helping you build some alerts. And using these tools and a few other things, we're going to get you to 10% and expand wealth. And then the third session for expand wealth will be, uh, a, a, it'll be a, um, several topics. One is asset allocation, which most money managers talk about. We'll talk about all the different types of retirement accounts, like 401k, IRA, Roth accounts. And then we'll talk about uh, capital gains. So, so if you, uh, I'm going to talk about how you can minimize your taxes on capital gains. So that'll get you to 15%. And then the last two expand wealth sessions will be on buying individual stocks. And the first one, I'll be talking about all the greatest investors of all time and what their investing strategies are. So I will go over Warren Buffett, uh, Peter Lynch, and a few others and tell you what their individual strategies are and how they approached uh, selecting stocks. Uh, I think it's always good to learn from the people who are acknowledged as the greatest investors of all time. And then the last session on uh, uh, buying individual stocks, I'm going to begin talking about investment newsletters. You know, there are a number of people out there who write newsletters who help you uh, select stocks. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about individual stock picking. So those will be the five sessions on Expand Wealth. And by the end of today, we'll have done two of them. So let's uh, dig deeper into this expand wealth. Um, just by way of review, um, this is 90 years of the, uh, the S&P 500 from 1930 to 2020. And what this chart shows you is that uh, the stock market or the S&P 500 is constantly improving in spite of the fact that there have been 15 significant recessions over the last 90 years. So in spite of that, yeah, it's grown very nicely. And as investors, this is really the wind in our sails. Uh, it shows you that you know, just by investing in something like this, the S&P 500, you can see a nice gain consistently over uh, a long period of time. And that's what uh, the benefits of investing are. If you took those same 90 years and you plotted it in a histogram like this, you can see it looks like a, a nice normal bell curve, which we've talked about. And you'll see that the average annual uh, uh, change is a plus 7% over 90 years. So that's quite a, a, a good track record for the S&P 500. And it's what we rely on to enjoy the benefits that we're talking about. And one thing I, I always remind people is that the stock market does not always go up. So over the last 90 years, you can see 70% of the time uh, the stock market goes up, but 30% of the time it goes down. So it's not something that you can expect that it will go up every year. It will go up some years, it will go down some years, but over the long run is what you're counting on. And uh, we learned that uh, the standard deviation 
of the S&P 500 is about 19%. So that's quite a wide variation. But what it tells you is that two thirds of the years are between uh, 11% loss and a 26% gain. So that should give you some comfort that over the long haul, investing in the stock market, investing in uh, ETFs makes a lot of sense. Now here's a 30 year window. And now we start to drill down a little bit. Uh, last year, the S&P did 16%, which is an excellent return. Uh, over a five year period, you're seeing 12% return. And over a 10 year period, you see 11% return. So that's the power of the stock market and that's the power of investing in it. Uh, the market itself has a very positive trend. And when you invest in some of the things that I talk about, you're really enjoying the benefits of those trends. So uh, I want to emphasize that the strategies I've put together, you're both uh, for session two, as well as today's session, uh, really designed to minimize your risk. And there was five things I did to minimize your risk. The one was I start out with just $1,000, which, um, which means that that's the most you can lose. Number two, I focused on ETFs, which are baskets of stocks. So you've got some diversification within the ETFs. Then I only gave you low risk ETFs to buy. So you know, anything you buy in the list I give you is already a, a very, um, a very, very safe. And then finally, I asked you to invest in different sectors and different indexes so that you wouldn't be concentrated on one area. So that also reduces risk. And finally, I had you buy $100 every week as a way to reduce the timing risk. And I shared you a list of 88 ETFs um, for you to pick from. I had you uh, pick 10 of them and then uh, sort them in terms of uh, your confidence level. And I recommended you buy one ETF for $100 a week for 10 weeks. So this was the uh, phase one summary. Uh, put $1,000 in the account, you reviewed that list of 88 ETFs, you fill out a worksheet for 10 ETFs that were in different sectors and different indexes. And then you sorted these 10 ETFs by your, your confidence level. And then I asked you to buy $100 a week for four weeks. And then in week five, I asked you to fill out the worksheet again because now you've got some more information. And then you were to continue buying $100 per week for the next six weeks. So for 10 weeks, you invest $1,000 at a rate of $100 per week. So now let's go to the next level. Uh, when you look at investing, there's actually two ways of looking at it. And I call it the absolute performance versus the relative performance. So absolute performance is really like your raw test score. So if you were you know, in college and you took a test, and let's say you get an 80, um, that would be your raw test score. And 80 may be a, may be a B uh, as a raw test score. So this is a very important metric because this actually reflects your return. But in college, as you know, you know courses or, or tests are graded on a curve. So it may turn out that the highest score in your, for the test was really maybe just an 85. So maybe your 80 is actually an A. So uh, that's, Another important measure of your investing skill, it's how you invest relative to how the market's doing. Um, so I've got a couple of examples that will really bring it home. The first is, you know, if you had a 10% return last year and the S&P grew 15%, then your absolute return would be a plus 10%, which is, which is good. I mean, that, that's a very good return if you can do that consistently but your relative return would be minus 5% because you did 5% worse than the S&P. So that's not so good. Uh, the second example is if you had a 10% return last year and the S&P grew only 5%, then again, your, your absolute return would be 10%, which is good. And your relative return would be 5%, which is also good. So you did 5% better than the market. So. It's important to look at both metrics because they, they actually help you understand different things. The absolute metric is absolutely how much you know, money you're making each year, which is extremely important. Uh, the relative 
metric really uh, is about how well you're doing relative to the market. And that's also very important because if the market's doing very well, you want to beat the market. And if the market is not doing so well, as long as you beat it, even if you're losing money, that's that's already successful. So um, keep in mind those two metrics. So if I look at my BAM account um, over the last uh, few months, uh, let me see this. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is So I updated the spreadsheet to calculate your return before we only did absolute return. So the new sheet, which I have in, um, in uh, the month uh, session five BAM folder, uh, adds two sections, it adds an S&P 500 index and adds a NASDAQ index. So what you do is you fill out all the blue squares and then you see uh, your absolute return annualized in the green squares. And then you have to compare it to what the S&P has done or compare it to what the uh, NASDAQ has done. So this is a new uh, tool in the uh, Become a Millionaire folder for session five that you should download and use from now on. Hey, hey, Phil, let, yes. let Edmund into, into the meeting. Oh, okay. Where is he? He, he, oh, he said he's, he's waiting. waiting, waiting, waiting yeah, yeah, yeah. Three people. I'm sorry. I, I got too engrossed in this. Yeah, there's three people there. Okay. Okay. Thank you for, thank you for letting me know. <laughs> hey, Edmund. Thank you. Hey. I've been waiting, trying to join, but it wouldn't let me in. I'm sorry. I was so engrossed uh, talking <laughs> okay. about this stuff that... Uh, it's okay. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, Peter reminded me. So thank you, Peter. Thank you. Right. Okay. So if I look at my BAM account, uh, you can see this was as of about a week ago, which is when I actually did uh, wrote this presentation. Uh, the last few days have not been good. So everything's gone down, but at least as of um, April 25th, is when, which is when I did this, uh, you can see uh, the ETFs that I've selected. I select the SOX, IHI, PSI, VGT, PSJ, QQQ, and IGV. And uh, the ones that uh, you see the current value, which is uh, in the 200s, those are the ones I invested twice. And then the 100s are the ones I invested once. And you can see that the SOX is up 9%, IHI is up 8%, PSI is up 4%, BGT is up 2%, PSJ 2%, QQQ 0.9%, and IGV is down 1%. So, Overall, this was a 3.9% improvement over the last uh, two, three months. So now if you take that performance and you uh, look at it in terms of absolute performance, so uh, my absolute percent is 17% annualized. It's 3.9% is for the three months, 17.9% annualized. And then if you compare it to the S&P 500, which has done very well, it's done like 9%. Uh, and if you annualize it, it's 42%. I'm actually 24% behind the S&P 500. So again, two ways of looking at it. But if I compare it to the NASDAQ index, which we'll talk a lot more about today, uh, I'm actually beating NASDAQ by 4%. So it, uh, it just shows you uh, looking at performance uh, is important and you have to look at it a couple of different ways. It's not, a, it's not a, a, just a one way of looking at it. So at this point, we've been investing for about 12 weeks. You know, we, we made 10 buys in the 12 weeks. Uh, it's too early to draw any long-term conclusions, but I hope you realize that this approach can work, uh, number one. And then number two, uh, you can see it's a relatively safe approach. I mean, uh, we, we, it was, we haven't lost any of our initial thousand dollars that we've even made a few dollars. And then uh, I'm, I've gotten 17% over the last three months annualized. So I think that we, we can see a way of getting the 5% in the long run using this approach. So that's very important. Um, so what kind of ex returns can you expect with this phase one investing. So here's where I, I'm gonna provide a lot more detail about why I think this is a good strategy. So the, in session two, I just told you what to do. I gave you some reasons, but today I'm gonna to give you, um, you know, more in-depth reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing and why I think it's an effective strategy. So the 88 ETFs I gave you have an average return of 
17% over the last 10 years. So if these ETFs perform in a, in a similar way in the next 10 years, you can expect the average 17% as well. But we know that there's a lot of fluctuation in returns. And we also know there's a lot of randomness. So um, you probably should not expect 17%, and that's too aggressive. And we also know that past performance is not a guarantee of future results. So it's very important to know just because someone did well the last 10 years does not necessarily mean it'll do well in the next 10 years. But um, I think it is an indication that these stocks uh, are relatively, or these ETFs are relatively successful. So given that 17%, I think um, that gives me a 12% cushion to go from 17% down to 5%. So given that's a 17% average, uh, with a 12% cushion, I think I'm pretty comfortable telling you that if you do this strategy over the long haul, uh, I think it's very likely you'll get a minimum of 5% return. So that's really my explanation on that. So with that, I'll move on to 10% and I'm gonna explain that in a lot of detail. So before I do that, I'm gonna spend some time talking about the, the various stock market indexes. Um, up till now, we've focused almost exclusively on the S&P 500. And that turns out to be only one of many, many different indexes. So um, let's talk a little bit about the NASDAQ 100 compared to S&P 500. So uh, if you look at the detail on the, on the left-hand side, uh, you see that the blue bar is a NASDAQ and the red bar or the purple bar is the S&P 500. Of the last 13 years, basically from 2008 to 2020, the NASDAQ actually beats the S&P 11 of 13 years. So the NASDAQ from that perspective, from an average perspective, is actually a much better index to invest in than the S&P 500. Similarly, if you look at the chart on the right, if you invested $100 in 2008 in the S&P 500, you will have grown that in, in 13 years to um, $350, which is actually a very, very good return. I mean, if you put down, uh, um, let's say $100,000 in 13 years, that would be worth $350,000. But if you look at the NASDAQ, if you put down 100,000 on the NASDAQ in 2008, that would actually grow to $700,000. So that's a 7X growth. So that just shows you the difference between the two indexes and the uh, relative performance between the two. If you dig one level deeper and we look at what's stocks are within the two ETFs, uh, you see the uh, NASDAQ is in the blue bar and the S&P 500 is in the purple. And if you look at the stocks in it, uh, you'd be surprised to see that there's a tremendous amount of overlap. Apple's in both lists, Microsoft, Amazon, Tesla, Facebook, Google, Nvidia, PayPal, Intel, Comcast, and Netflix are on both lists. So there's a lot of overlap between the NASDAQ 100 and the S&P 500. But what you can see is that the NASDAQ is more tech heavy. And these 22 stocks on the NASDAQ represent 69% of the NASDAQ index. Whereas uh, S&P 500 has the same stocks, but these 22 stocks only represent 38% of the S&P 500. And the S&P is much more diversified. It has financial services. It has uh, insurance. It has pharmaceuticals. So it has a range of other industries in the, in the larger 500 companies in America, whereas the NASDAQ is actually more tech heavy. So taking it one step further, I add the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which are 30 stocks to this chart. And now I look over a 45 year period, which is from 1975 to the year 2020. You can see that the S&P 500 averaged about 10% annual growth 
for those 45 years. The Dow Jones got about 9% in those 45 years, but the NASDAQ actually did 15%, which is you know, very impressive. Um, what's even more interesting and more important for you to realize is that the standard deviation for the, the S&P 500 is 15%, but for the NASDAQ, it's actually 24%. So that's a much, much bigger standard deviation. And it means that that start will be a lot more volatile than S&P 500. The Dow Jones is much closer to the S&P 500. So if you look at sort of the one standard deviation for the S&P 500, which is two thirds of the time, it'll sit between a negative 5%, you're know, losing 5% to making 26%, which is um, you know, very nice. But if you look at the NASDAQ, you can make 39% you know, within two thirds of the time, but you can lose over 9%. So that's just a much larger range and it's a much riskier proposition. So um, you think about it, it just offers a lot greater return, but it, offer, it does that at a much higher risk. And that's what we're gonna continue to talk about uh, over the next um, few sessions. Um, when you move that to individual stocks, uh, the stand deviation for that is even higher, which means that the returns could be significantly higher, but so can the, the losses. So that's something to be cognizant of as we talk about uh, making uh, investments in individual stocks and what some of the, the, the um, what some of the potential is for high returns and what some of the pitfalls for, for huge losses might be. So uh, I share this just so that you understand the range of return and the range of risk associated with these different indexes and different ways of investing. So we're gonna dig one level deeper into the last 45 years for those, uh, for those three indexes. And what I wanted to highlight was uh, the, the run up from 1995 to 1999. This was the internet.com period where uh, a lot of companies went public and became uh, very successful. Uh, you can see the S&P 500 grew 34%, then 20%, then 30%, 26%, and 19%. That is fantastic uh, uh, growth of the S&P in those five years. The NASDAQ is even more impressive. It grew 39%, then 22%, then 21%, 39%, and a full 85% in the year 1999. Very, very impressive. And, and uh, the Dow Jones also grew very nicely. Now, for the first time in stock market history, after those five great years, there was actually three consecutive years of very significant losses. So you can see that S&P went down 10%, then went down another 13%, and then it went down another 23%. So all told, it probably went down about 50 to 55% in those three years. The NASDAQ went down even more. It went down 39% in the year 2000. Then it went down an additional 21%. And then it went down an additional 31%. That's almost like 60, 70, 5% that it went down in those three years after obviously a very significant run up. Um, it just shows you that, you know, there can be times that are very frothy where you know, everything you buy will go up and, you know, the, the market is, is uh, very hot. And then there are times when everything you buy goes down and this is a very bearish market. So, um, as a long-term investor, you can have to expect periods where the stock market goes down, but you have to have faith that in the long run, uh, it will pay off. Um, if we look at the last couple of years, 2019 and 2020, you can see that uh, the S&P went up 28% in 19 and 16% in 20, which is very good. The NASDAQ, did even better the last couple of years. It did 35%, followed by 43%, and then Dow did 22% and 7%. So that just gives you just a little more perspective and understanding of the S&P, the NASDAQ, and also the Dow Jones. If you look at the Wall Street Journal, 
they publish these indexes every day in the Wall Street Journal. So if you look at Dow Jones, there's actually six different indexes that they report on daily. Uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is the, the 30 we talked about. They have a transportation average, a utility average, 65 composite, the entire stock market and the Barron's 400. So those are six indexes that the Dow Jones uh, tracks. S&P, which stands for Standard & Poor's, tracks five indexes. They track the S&P 500, which was talked about. Uh, they also track the uh, S&P 100 index, a mid cap 400, which are medium sized companies, a small cap, 600, which are smaller companies, Supercomp 1500. And then there are three NASDAQ indexes. There's a NASDAQ composite, there's a NASDAQ 100 that we talked about, and then there's also a NASDAQ biotech index. And then there are even more indexes beyond that. There's the New York Stock Exchange composite, there's the Russell 1000, 2000, 3000, there's the Philadelphia Exchange for gold and silver, Philadelphia Exchange for oil, and the Philadelphia Exchange for Semiconductors. So hopefully this gives you a, a more well-rounded understanding of indexes. Obviously there's S&P 500, which is very well known. There's the Dow Jones, and then there's the NASDAQ, but there's also many of indexes that track a lot of different things. So let's, let's dig one level deeper into this um, expand wealth 10%. So what I'd like you to do now we, we're, we're at week 12. So starting week 13, I want you to put another $2,000 into your BAM account if you can afford it. Um, if you can't, then put what you can afford. Uh, now I want you to focus on the top 44 ETFs only. So don't look at 88, look at the top 44. Fill out that worksheet I gave you for all 44. So I want you to look at all 44 of the ETFs, top 44. ETFs, and now it's okay that uh, you include ETFs from the same sector, or same index. Now it's okay. I want you to rank all four ETFs by the, your confidence that a particular ETF will basically double in five years. So what is your confidence? If you're, if you're very confident that it will double in five years, then you give that a, a 10. If you're not confident or you don't think it will double in five years, you give it a one. If you think it's 50-50, then give it a five. So I want you to rank all 44 ETFs based on just your gut feel. I'm not asking you to do a lot of research. You know, Just look at the name of it, click in to the ETF and, and learn a little bit about the ETF and just give it a number between one and 10, depending on your level of confidence that will double in five years. Then take your top 30 ETFs by confidence and put it into a become a millionaire watch list. So this is a basically a list of um, ETFs that you can quickly look at because you have it saved. Um, and now I want you to, of the $2,000 that you put in, I want you to invest $200 a week by investing $100 in two ETFs per week by buying on a dip. So. This is uh, similar to the strategy I mentioned before, but I'll give you a lot more detail this time. So set up an alert on your, on your phone um, for, from your brokerage account. You can set up an alert that says, if uh, IVV, which is S&P 500 index, drops by 1% or QQQ, which is the NASDAQ, drops by 1% or declines by 1% or more in a day, send an alert to your phone. That way you don't have to be looking at the, um, the S&P 500 and NASDAQ every day. You, you can just, if you, you don't get an alert, you don't have to look that day. But when you get an alert, those are days I want you to look at your Become a Millionaire watch list. Look at the, you know, the five, six, seven uh, highest decliners. So sort them by percentage decline and only invest if the ETF is down at least 2%. So, um, so this concept of two investments per week is meant to be more of an average. So it's more important to buy in a dip. So if there's one week that you know there's a, a nice dip and you buy three, that's okay. Next week buy one. So try to keep two week per two investments per week average, but it's not important that it's exactly two a week. If you did four one week and zero the next, that's okay. 
The idea is to try to buy it on a dip of at least 2%. So I want you to do this between weeks 13 and week 23. And if you do that successfully, then by week 23 or, or by week 26, which is half a year, you have invested $3,000. And by that time, you will have looked at these ETFs, you have seen how they fluctuate, you'll see your results. And at that point, which will be about August, I will come back and talk to you more about what the next step is. But you know, if you successfully invested the first thousand and then now move on to the second thousand, you invest the 3,000, you will find that this is a very safe approach and you'll start to see some nice returns. So, what are the expected returns in phase two? And let me just explain to you how I derived that. So the average historical return for these 44 ETFs, the top 44 is actually 19%, which is 2% higher than the 17% from before. So if these ETFs perform you know, similarly in the next 10 years as it did the past 10, you sh should get an average about 19%. And if on top of that, you buy it at a minimum 2% dip, you can be expecting returns of closer to 21%. So um, again, we know this randomness, and again, we know the past performance and I guarantee a future results, but now we have an 11% cushion to get to 10%. So even if it does half of the 21%, you're still hitting 10%. So that's how I came across uh, the strategy for both 5% and 10% based on uh, what I've been teaching you. Um, so a good question you should ask is, you know, why did I select 10 years? And why didn't I select one year? Why didn't I select three years? Or why didn't I select five years? So the reason I chose uh, 10 years and not three or one, you know, the, the argument's the same whether it's three years or one year, but let me use one year as the example, because I think that makes the uh, argument clearer. So there are a few reasons why uh, using the list of highest one-year returns you know, can be erroneous. First, so maybe the year before last year, it had a, a really horrible year. Maybe it went down 40% that year. And then last year it did 50%. So you know, combined it did maybe 5% a year. So that's not so good. But if you bought it based on the 50%, you know, it was just recovering what it lost the year before. So I think that that's an erroneous strategy. Uh, another possible mistake, even if that didn't happen, uh, if it did 50% last year, it could be uh, it could be poised for a, a 20 or 30% drop the year after it goes up 50%. So again, you don't want to buy after a big year because you know it, it could revert to uh, closer to what was the year before. So that's another reason why uh, I wouldn't buy on a one year. And I think the same argument goes for the three years. Now, you can argue that the 10 years has the same problem. So if 11 years ago, you had a, a really bad year, um, yes, that would have made uh, the, the 10 year ago year look good. But uh, I would argue that something that happened 11 years ago just isn't as relevant as if it happened one year ago or four years ago. And um, 10 years is a long period of time. So uh, I believe that if you can be successful in 10 years, you must be doing something right. Um, yeah, so uh, you will not have an ETF make that list unless you know, the index was you're following some powerful stocks or unless that, that industry was, was seeing a lot of uh, momentum. So I think a 10-year return is actually a very good indicator of future performance. So at this point, I'm gonna spend some time sharing with you how I came up with the list of 88 because I want you to learn the process of doing it because that will make you a better investor in the future. So what I used is an ETF screener from Fidelity. So what is an ETF screener? So a screener is a tool used by traders to separate ETFs depending on user-defined metrics. And I'm gonna show you how I do this for um, uh, 
The 10 year return, but I'm also going to uh, return the year to date performance, one year performance, three year performance, and five year performance. So, so let me show you this uh, little video and I'll just talk you through it. So basically, if you hover over news and research in, in, um, in your Fidelity account, uh, after a few seconds, you know, all the choices become visible. You go down to hit the ETF link and you wait for this screen to show up. And then on the lower left-hand corner, you launch the ETF screener. So that's what I was talking about. So if you launch ETF screener, then you go to the left and you say view all. This will show you all the criteria you can select by. So you've got uh, basic ETF facts you can select by. You can have technicals. You can have analyst ratings, objectives, performance, and I will select year to date, one year, three year, five year, and 10 year. And you can also do uh, exposure by country, by sector, you can do volatility, tax considerations, you can do um, trading characteristics, fundamentals. So there are a lot of uh, different criteria you can select. I only selected the market total return that, and then you would go down and you would hit apply criteria. And this will return the, the list of ETFs that fit this criteria. And what I will do is I think I'm, I'm gonna go over to the right and sort it by 10 years. I think the video is a little slow. And you have net assets, you got the year to date returns, one year, three year, 10 years. So I'm gonna sort it by 10 years. And you can see SOX, SMH, PSI, XSD, XBI. So these are the, the ETFs that were in the list of 88. When you, saw, when you download it, it asks you what you want to download. So I just click all the boxes because each one becomes a tab in the spreadsheet. You say continue. And what it will do is it will you know, download those into a spreadsheet that I will open them in Excel and uh, take a few seconds and I just arrange it a little bit. So here's the same ETFs. You see SOX, SMH, PSI, XSD, and uh, I think I'm just gonna organize a little bit so you can see all the columns. You see, I think I widened the screen. Let me see. So there's the, the year to date. Those are additional fields. I think I start, uh, wrap the titles. So this is how I came up with my list of 88 stocks. I sorted and basically just pulled off the, the top 88. And you can see those are the 10 year returns I'm talking about. And I think that's, see, I think that's pretty much the end of the video. There you go, screening for ETFs. So you know, just to, to sort of um, summarize where we're at. So again, you know, we know that past performance, no guarantee of future results. They always tell you that, and that's true. And my list of 80 ETFs is based strictly on historical returns for the last 10 years. Um, so I am assuming that past performance, while it's not a guarantee of future results, it is an indication of future performance. Uh, it's hard to make this list of 88 or 44 just by being lucky or being a flash in the pan. 10 years is a long time. I believe that if an ETF performed well over a 10-year period, I'm assuming that their good performance will continue, but it may not be true. So that's why while this is list of 44 you should look at, I'm not telling you to use all 44. I want you to go through all 44. And if you think a particular ETF is going to decline in the next decade, then do not choose it. So you know, you're only picking 30 of the 44. 
Uh, I'll give you a good example. Uh, I don't believe in cannabis. Uh, I, I don't think it's a good thing. Um, you know, if a cannabis ETF was to make the, the top 44 of the list, I would not select it because I don't believe in it. You know, I, I'm not sure that it would do well in the future. So even if it showed good performance the last 10 years, if I don't believe in that particular um, index, then I will exclude from my list. And you should do the same thing. So I'm not asking you to blindly pick uh, these 44. I'm asking you to use the 44 as a screener, as the 44 that you look at, and then you will weed out the ones that you think are bad, and you will select the ones that you think are good. And that's how I think that the process will reflect your personal experience and help you get the kind of return you want based on the industries and the indices that you believe in. So by way of summary, um, you know, we've revealed the phase one investing and we provide a rationale for why this strategy should get you at least uh, 5% with a 12% cushion you remember. And then we also reviewed phase two investing uh, and we provide a rationale why you should get 10%, which is an 11% cushion. And then we talked about absolute return and relative return and why they are important. And then I talked about the ETF screener and I showed you the process of how you can uh, identify your own uh, screened ETFs. Uh, and I explained how you can adjust the criteria to screen for other types of things. So I have two homeworks for this particular exercise. You know, the first one is to uh, go through the, the top 44 ETFs on the using ETF selection worksheet uh, and then select the top 30 and put it into a watch list in your brokerage account and then set the alerts for IBB and QQQ on your phone for a 1% decline. So that's homework assignment one. Homework assignment two is to uh, go into the screener and screen for five-year return instead of 10-year return. And then compare the two lists, compare the five-year return list with the top 88 from before. There'll be some ETFs that are on the five-year list and not on the, the 88 ETF list. And there'll be some on the 88 list that will not be on the five-year return list. You should uh, take a look at it and see if you can come up with some reasons to why that's true, because that's important in improving your understanding of, of these ETFs and their returns, and uh, it will just help you be a better investor in the future. So now let's move on to the next section, which is um, Become a Millionaire Plan Part 1. So just by way of review, you know, the, your Become a Millionaire Project Plan needs to be short and sweet. Uh, I always like to do things based on calendar year because I think that that's a good way to organize your um, future plans. So, uh, And then it's important to provide a timeline for your wealth creation and then what outline what your strategies are, and then each strategy has to have a timeline. So that's what this is about. Uh, we've done the self-assessment. We're now developing the plan. We have done expand wealth five and 10%. We've done augment income five and 10%. And we've done cut expenses five and 10%. We've done uh, part one of uh, real estate, buy a home. And we've done uh, part one of cut your taxes as part of real estate. Uh, we have not done continuous improvement and we've not done momentum. But uh, this plan will pull all these elements together. So two parts to this uh, uh, putting together your BAM project plan. Part one will be today and we'll put together numbers associated with the plan. And then part two is next month where we will put together the PowerPoint that explains your strategies in, in, uh, in words. So as I mentioned, um, this plan will pull together things uh, based on where you are financially. Where, when do you expect to master the four uh, BAM strategies, which is to augment income, cut expense, expand wealth, and buy a home? Um, we'll put some timelines on that. And then next month, we'll explain that in words. So I'll be providing two different files for this process. The first is the Become a Mania template spreadsheet, which we'll go over today. 
And then next month after become a mania template PowerPoint that will be in the BAM session six folder. Um, part one, I've tried really hard to make it simple. So uh, you just have to follow uh, my four steps and you will get there. Step one is to provide some basic information. Step two is to let us know what your current net worth is. Step three is to talk about your, your ACE strategies when you expect to reach what levels. And then step four is to review the numbers. So what I'm gonna do at this point is I'm gonna uh, switch over to, a, I'm gonna share the spreadsheet. I'm gonna share the uh, become a mania spreadsheet. So as you can see, um, This is to become a main air spreadsheet. So step one, uh, you know, just like most of the things I do, the blue squares are the places where you fill in the numbers. So you enter your year of birth. So I've just uh, used an example here. This person was born in 1985. Uh, the current year is 2021. And then I want you to um, put down what you're feeling about your, uh, your plan leaning. So you can do this uh, you know, several ways, but you can be conservative, which means that, um, uh, oh, let's just say 75%, sorry. Conservative, which is 75% chance of success. Realistic, which is 50-50. And aggressive, which is uh, 20, only 25% of success. So on this plan, I've selected um, realistic. And then you, you post your annual salary, which uh, for 2021, so I put 50,000 here for this person. And then I put down their non-retirement account. You know, this would be you know, any brokerage account, savings account, et cetera. You may have full 1K kind of work, an IRA, Roth IRA. You may have other assets. So um, the orange are calculated fields. So that 39 is the total of all of your assets. And then we put all of your debts here your uh, long-term debt, your student loans, car loans, your credit card debt. Now, I would only put credit card debt if you do not pay off the entire amount at the end of every month. If you're paying it down to zero and you're just using it to, to make your purchase, but you pay off in the, the month, I would leave these zero. So only put a number here if you do not pay off your entire uh, credit card every month. And again, this orange field is calculated and you're so this example, this person starts with nineteen thousand dollars. So that's a, oh, that's actually step two, right? So step one was the, the basic stuff. So actually, let me let me shrink this a little bit. Okay. So step one was the 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 basic information that we filled out. We just filled out the current net worth. And now we're gonna fill out the ACE strategies. And we want the timeline for mastering. So you ask, answer this question to your own home. If you don't own a home, then you should put down when you expect to, to purchase a home. So in this example, I put 2025. So which is your four years from now. For you, it may be 2024, maybe 2026, maybe 2030. but. Uh, try to come up with what you think is a realistic time for you to buy a home. And then the blue squares uh, you need to fill in, which is, you know, as of 2021, what are your uh, augment outside career uh, percent, augment income outside career, augment income inside career, uh, cut to save 5%, expand wealth 5%. So I put in pretty modest numbers for uh, 20, yeah. I put in pretty modest numbers for, for, for 2021. And then I assume that you know, by the year 2024, you will have improved your augment income from 5% to 6%. I'm going to assume that you went from 5% to 7% in 2023 for, for your, what you cut to save and you'll get to expand wealth 10% uh, by 2020. Those are only three assumptions I made. And 
after you do that, let me open this up a little bit. We'll open up uh, step four. And what you should do is you should reveal the results of what you've entered. So So you can see that um, this 19,000 is what we started with. Uh, you know, these are all the results of what you entered in terms of what you can save. And row 70 is what your net worth would be without your home. And you remember we, we bought a home in 2025. So therefore starting 2026, you have some equity. So you should look at that. And then if you look at the total, which would be uh, your net worth plus the uh, home equity. And you will see if we keep going to the right, now we're out to, uh, oh. I have some tabs that on, on the top that actually shrink a little bit, but uh, let me see. So here's we have about half a million. So it looks like in the year, 2045, when this gentleman is 60 years old, he will become a mania. And that's based on those very modest numbers I talked about. The other thing I did was, I, if you recall in session one, we talked about this net worth percentile, one, two, three, four, five. So I've mapped it to, to row 74 in the spreadsheet. So you start at level two, and then uh, in the in 2021, at age 36, by the time you get to 23, you will have gotten to level three. At age 41, you've gotten level four. So every couple of years, you see you're, you're making progress up that level, uh, all the way to becoming uh, level nine, which is the millionaire level. So. It's a nice progress chart for you to monitor. And if you look at the chart down here, this is, oh, I'm gonna expand. Okay. So now if you look at the net worth forecast, you can see that uh, the million dollars around here at age 60, he becomes a millionaire. That's a million 81. And by the time he's 86 years old, which is another 26 years later, at least according to this chart, if he continues to get the, the 10%, he'll have $10 million. So this person reaches a million at age 60 and becomes a, a 10 millionaire by age 86. So um, go back to the PowerPoint. So I just had the same stuff in, in the, the PowerPoint, but I thought we'd better show you in the spreadsheet. So this BAM Become a Millionaire Plan spreadsheet brings together your current net worth, your current salary, when you buy a home, when you expect to, to improve your augment income numbers. And I was pretty modest. I only augment income up to 6%. You can, I believe you can get the 10, 15%. Uh, the cut expense, I capped at 7%. I think you can get the 10 to 15% on that. And then the expand wealth, uh, I had up to 10%. So you could probably get to 15% of that. So I use very modest numbers. And as you can see, uh, this hypothetical person becomes a millionaire at age 60 and uh, does very well after that. So this was a... So the homework for session five is to complete steps one, two and three of the Becoming a Millionaire template spreadsheet. And homework number four is to identify the yellow cells that you changed uh, and make them green. If you, if you recall when I, um, the yellow cells, that, that just lets us know which ones you changed to um, the number. So that next month, we're gonna do something with explaining your changes. Um, 
In terms of reviewing the spreadsheet, you should look at uh, row 55, which is your net worth at the beginning of period. Row 56 is your annual income and how that changes every year. Row 69 is your net worth without a home. Row 75 is your net worth with a home. And row 73 is your BAM level. So you need to find out which year you will become a millionaire and what age will you be. And make sure everything makes sense. If it doesn't, you may have to adjust the numbers. So you guys have made excellent progress. You know, we've come a long way and I'm very proud of you guys. Um, so next month we'll complete this plan by putting the PowerPoint template together that matches the numbers that you have created this month. So in terms of where we are, you know, we've done uh, sessions one through five. Um, and next month we'll do augment income 15% and we'll do become a main at project plan session two. And then uh, in July, we'll do the cut expense 15%, expand wealth 15%. So you'll be well on your way. So I believe that's it. So, oh, that's a summary of what we learned today. So what did we learn today? So I spoke you know, in depth about expand wealth 5%, you know, not only what you do, but why you do it and why I believe that that's a good strategy to give you 5% annually. And I did the same thing for expand wealth 10%. And then we talked a lot more about the NASDAQ index. We talked about the Dow Jones industrial average, and we talked about a bunch of other indices. And then we learned how to write part one of the Become a Mania plan. And in summary, you know, there are five items in the homework this month. You have to create your BAM watch list. You have to screen for uh, the list of ETFs with the best five-year return. You have to do step one, two, and three if you become a millionaire spreadsheet. You have to change the yellow cells to green that you edited, and you have to look at your become a millionaire spreadsheet. So with that, we complete uh, session five. Congratulations. So with that, I'm gonna uh, stop sharing and open up to comments and questions. Okay, how's everyone doing? good hey paul good i had a question about your your notifications of one percent uh yes. down days yes so like today the nasdaq went down at one percent yep so would that mean you would buy yep tomorrow morning or something or no no, no i bought today you can buy today. tomorrow morning too but i bought today okay. i got my alert around um 11 o'clock <laughs> okay so, so uh, and then, then the S and P, I got about two o'clock. <laughs> yeah. So I got both alerts, and and so I was monitoring my BAM. Um, actually, I think I bought a couple of things today. Yeah. No, it, today was definitely a good day to buy. <laughs> okay. I mean, the whole idea is that you know you already love these ETFs, right? Because that's how I made the list, and now you're just trying to buy in a dip. So I think I bought them at like a three to four percent dip. I, some I bought a four percent dip. I bought, some I bought like three and a half percent dip. So I love that. Yeah, that's good. But you know, tomorrow's not too late. I mean, because it, it didn't go up. Sometimes it dips and it, it bounces back. So you obviously don't want to um, miss that window. But if it doesn't bounce back, you may have another day or two to, to, to do it. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Hey, Phil. Hey, hey, Eddie. How you doing? It's a, it's a good day, you know. And I'm going to embarrass you a little bit. You know why it's a good oh, day? Why is that? Today's Phil's birthday, everyone. Oh, yeah. No, I'm not embarrassed. I'm not embarrassed <laughs> a, at all. So it was a memorable day. That's why it's a Happy good day. Happy birthday to me. Happy yeah. birthday, Phil. Happy birthday, Phil. I'm one year older and one year wiser. Happy birthday, Phil. Thank you. Happy Thank birthday, you Phil. Hey, Any wishes Phil. come true. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. Well, I got a, a message from Zhang too. But thank you. You know, it's uh, yeah. I'm 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 getting up there, and you know, but I feel very young. I'm retired. And I'm doing this for fun. <laughs> so, Edmund, what did you think of the session? It was it was good, except for the first fifteen minutes. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you got to come on time. I, I I got so I got so into it. I got so yeah, into yeah. It. it sounds like um, it, it, you know. It, I you mean, know, this... Emin, Emin, when I post on YouTube, go watch the first 15 minutes. 
because it, it was a great <laughs> poem. This was my declamation poem from Boston Latin. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will, and the road you're charging seems all uphill, I did don't quit. <laughs> yeah, so don't quit. You know, but it was, it was good. It was good. Uh, anyways, good. yeah, happy birthday, Phil. Thank you. We'll, we'll, Thank we'll you. get to uh, celebrate it shortly. Absolutely. Anyone, um, anyone have comments or thoughts or questions? I'm open. Yeah. Don't miss out. This is a big opportunity. This yeah, is a once in a lifetime opportunity. <laughs> you know, I've been thinking about what I'm going to do next year. Because obviously, you know, my curriculum will run through the end of this year. And um, that's another seven sessions. And I have, I have half the remaining sessions mapped out already. And I'm right now leaning to um, you know, not redoing this next year. So you guys may be the lucky people that enjoy this course. I may do something different next year, but I don't think I'm going to re repeat this become a main air 101 course. I might do a, um, I might do something with the existing students as a way to help them move forward, but I won't redo what we've done. So uh, you guys sh uh, should feel fortunate because uh, at, at least as of today, I don't plan to redo this. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. <laughs> Because it's a lot of work, Phil. <laughs> you know, it is a lot of work, but it's also uh, very enjoyable. Uh, I, I, do, I do feel very fortunate to be part of it. Thank you. Yeah, um, same here. I, uh, I actually learned a lot because I actually, I mean, I know a lot of this already, but um, putting the course together makes me know it better than I would have known it if I didn't put the course together because I had to do a lot of research and and so it, uh, so I'm, I'm learning as well. Uh, one thing that really surprised me is how modest the numbers I put in were. Yeah, I only put in 6% for augmented income, 7% for cut expense, and 10% for expand wealth. That got you to be a millionaire in basically 24 years, because this was a, this was a 36-year-old with $19,000 making $50,000 a year. In 24 years, they were a millionaire at those modest numbers. I had put in 10, 15% for those numbers and those numbers just went crazy. And I, I just uh, didn't think anyone would believe me. So I reduced them. I reduced them as much as I could because if I used the real numbers, because I think you can really get the 15% off free. I, I, that's not, it's work, but it's not impossible. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You can get the 15% expand wealth. You can get the 15% augment income and you can get the 15% in cut expense. Uh, you can do it within two, three years if you really work at it. If you do that, it will not be 24 years to get you the main year. It's probably a lot less than that. Yeah, I'm thinking you know, maybe 15 to 18 years. It's really remarkable. And it's all because of compound growth. It's all about compound growth. You're compounding your income. You're compounding what you save. And you're compounding your, um, your wealth. So it's really quite remarkable. I'm, 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 even though I know it, seeing the numbers, I mean, seeing that 60 year old become, have 10 million by the time he's 86. I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. But if you think about it, me if, 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 if you invest, if, if you had a million dollars in 2008, you'd have 7 million by 2020. <laughs> that's only 13 years. That's not even 26 years. So. Everyone else is so quiet. Can I get some feedback, guys? So I think for me, it's Sherry Lynn from Canada. Yeah. Um, the session was fantastic. I think for me, um, there's a lot of information that was shared tonight, and I have to go and play with the spreadsheet to be able to take what you've talked about and translate it to make sure my understanding, and I think that's where the questions would come. Okay. For me, it's a little bit, um, you know, I'm still processing it all. I understand. So I will probably have this post on YouTube by uh, by tomorrow morning. So it would be it would be good for you to go take a look at that as a way to you know figure out how to use the spreadsheet a little bit. 
Yeah, no, for sure. And I took notes, so I'm good there, right? And I, when I checked the um, temp this from, when I checked online um, in the BAM folder, the spreadsheet <laughs> weren't there. I have not uploaded it yet. Oh, okay, got yeah. it. Okay. Sorry, I'm, I was actually still editing it today, so. No, that's okay. That's okay. Perfect. Thank you. I'm glad I didn't upload because that, 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 that the twenty five percent, seventy five percent mixed up. So yeah, I'll upload it at the end of this session. Yeah. So I didn't upload anything. I, my, my, my mistake. I'm usually better prepared, but yeah, I'll, I'll have uploaded. It. I'm glad you reminded me. I thought about it earlier today, and then I just forgot about it. So yeah, it's not there yet. <laughs> Peter, I'm here. What do you think? I'm in deep thoughts. I'm in wow. deep thoughts. <laughs> That's good. That's good. You're, are you, you're, you're doing machine learning now, aren't you? You're, you're walking machine learning. I'm learning like a machine. I'm, I'm, I'm a machine. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, 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 it just takes, I mean, I, I'm just thinking, uh, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I just remember. I remember we had a conversation when we, she started this that, I said, you make sure you tell people it's not a get rich scheme. <laughs> I remember that. Like, yeah, get, get rich quick scheme? Yeah, yeah, get rich quick yeah. scheme. Because yeah. the title implies, like, wow, <laughs> it takes me a couple of days to be a millionaire. And, and you, you, have, you, have, you, have, oh, you have done that. You, 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 have, you, 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 you have taught people how to be a millionaire. And, and, and as this is not a get rich scheme and, and, and it's, it's abundantly clear as it's, 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 it's a method is a way of of thinking of saving of, of managing your life that that's very useful you know because uh, uh when you first uh i'm gonna teach you how to be a millionaire I said, what are you doing <laughs> go to go to vegas and then <laughs> win, win 10 hands in a row double each time that they kind of they kind of stuff <laughs> i was afraid you could do some of those <laughs> But no, no, oh, this is good. Next year, that's next year, <laughs> not this year. Yeah. No, this is this is very useful, and it's uh, and and and, and uh, I'm sure it's helpful for you to to find out the details of some of these index. You know what they made out of. You know, it's, it's, uh, it helps everyone. It helps helps us, and it helps you. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it's actually very helpful. You know, I mean. Today was actually a very bad day in the stock market. I don't, like, the NASDAQ was down like 2%, S&P was by down 1.5%. And because I'm teaching this course and all these ideas are, are fresh in my mind, I wasn't worried at all. I mean, yeah. look in the long run. I mean, if you look at your know, day to day and you know, see yes. the crashes, it, 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 it can be very daunting. And yeah. um, all I can say is don't be daunted because you know, in the long run, it will come back. That's the way it works. So, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 So what I've been doing, so I've been uh, tracking it every other day. Yeah. Just as, it's like a yo-yo. <laughs> it is like a yo-yo. It is, it's absolutely like a yo-yo. So one thing I'm going to talk about um, in the uh, first in individual investor session is a guy named Benjamin Graham. Benjamin Graham wrote the book on, um, security investing. I mean, he, he's basically Warren Buffett's professor. So he's at Columbia, actually, where, where your son is. He's at Columbia. Yeah. He was at Columbia. I think he's dead now. But Benjamin Graham, <laughs> the first two books on investing. And he talks about Mr. Market. And Mr. Market is the stock market. It's basically a, um, he's a very neurotic. So he's either euphoric and he goes crazy He's so happy, he, like he's buying, 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 or he's depressed. There's nothing in between. That's the way the market works. So if you look at stock market charts, it never goes in one direction. It always goes up, then it goes down, it goes up. So what you really should look at is like what you call the moving average. So you you kind of ignore the spikes up, spikes down, because the spike up and down, it's all corrections, right? So. The market is basically a, a neurotic character, right? When, when, when somebody starts buying and it goes up, they think that it's never going to end. So everyone jumps in until it hits this point where everyone says, you went crazy. So everyone sells. That's why it does that, right? So that's what, that's what Benjamin Graham teaches is that Mr. Market is neurotic and you cannot live your life based on what this neurotic person does. Right? That's the neurotic person. So you have to even that out by looking at trends because 
Trends means that you've ignored sort of daily, weekly, monthly, even annual spikes up and spikes down. Look at the uh, dot com boom. I mean, that was crazy. It went up probably you know, 500% in five, you know, probably 300% in five years. And then it went down about 80% in three years. So that's the neurotic behavior that um, Benjamin Graham talks about. And if you understand that, then you can take some of these, you know, you know, both the, the positives, which is, you know, goes up like crazy with a grain of salt. And you also take the going down with a grain of salt. You know, not that, you know, it, it, it doesn't affect you because, you know, unfortunately, that's your real return. But the market is going to, it goes up and down. Yeah. But, but I will talk about that because when, when I learned about that, I said, wow, that's exactly what the market is. Mr. Mark is neurotic. He's crazy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when if you look at it, you're going to go crazy. <laughs> So it, it does because you look at the, I look at so this is relatively new to me. In <laughs> I started looking at all my I have like a couple of uh, actually more than a couple of retirement accounts with other companies mm-hmm. and I'm thinking about consolidating them. Mm-hmm. And but they're all in mutual funds. And yep. no, there's so, nothing wrong with mutual funds. There's the only thing I don't like about mutual funds is the fees are higher. That's the only thing. Mutual fund and ETFs, actually, actually, there's two things I want. One is that the fees are high. The other thing is that it only updates its price once a day. You cannot, you know, it only updates its price at night. And I don't like the ETFs update their price throughout the day and you can sell anytime. So it's more like a stock. Mutual funds are like, I don't know why they do this, but they, you, if you sold a mutual fund in the middle of the day, you don't know what the price is until the, the day closes and then it tells you what it is. So. I don't personally like that, but they're fine. So uh, Peter Lynch, who's the guy who ran Mag- uh, Fidelity's Magellan, I think he did like 29% over 13 years. This was like, uh, you know, probably the, probably from the um, late seventies to early nineties. And he was, he's famous for running the Fidelity Magellan fund. He grew that fund like I think 29% compounded for 13 years, which is pretty impressive. Um, I can't remember my point, but but yeah. So I was talking about Peter Lynch too. He he's a guy that that uh, is supposed to be one of the gurus of investing. I'll talk about Warren Buffett because there, there's there's a, the, the Warren Buffett uh, investment advice. So you know, I mean, I'm 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 going to say this when I do these sessions. I'm actually not a good in, uh, individual stock investor. I'm really not. <laughs> I mean, investing in individual stocks, I would say, is probably three to four times harder to make money than in this investing in ETFs. Investing in ETFs is much less work. It's just much less volatile. I mean, individual stocks is just hard. I mean, I do it, but you know, I, don't, I don't do that well. I think I probably do better with my ETFs than I do with my individual stocks. So anyways, we'll, we'll talk more about that when we get to session four and five, but uh, that's the scoop. Um, hey, Carissa Bell. Hi. Are you there? How are you doing? Did you enjoy the session? Yes. <laughs> this is Carissa's first time. So uh, yeah. I, I uh, appreciate you coming and I hope that that was worthwhile. But some of these things may not have made sense because you didn't go through the first four sessions. So. I urge you to go to uh, the YouTube site and uh, start with uh, session one and uh, they're like an hour each. So you know, go through the first four sessions and then look at this session and it'll make more sense because uh, there's a lot of foundational stuff I talked about in sessions one through four that um, I'm expecting you'd already know. So uh, anyway, so you'll, you'll, uh, this will make a lot more sense if you went back and do that. But I'm glad you came. I, hopefully it made sense to you even without some of that foundational stuff. Thank you. I'll definitely do that. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anybody else? Anything else? If there's nothing else, I want to thank you all for joining and uh, we'll, we'll see you next time. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Phil. Thank, thank you, Phil. Thank you, Phil. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Happy birthday, Phil. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Have a great night. Happy Have birthday. a good night, everybody.